to everyone who's joining in today and also to those who will be uh, listening to and watching this uh, this webinar later. Um, it certainly uh, will be valuable to you. Um, and we're focusing on a conversation on addressing environmental sustainability. Um, a few years ago, Porter Protocol and Selenbosch Wine Roots uh, uh, got involved with each other and there really was Stellenbosch's idea to build a sustainable future, which is, is really relevant in the South African wine industry. But I just want to uh, introduce our panelists. Um, and uh, firstly, uh, a huge thank you to Jancis Robinson, uh, MW, who needs no introduction. Uh, and I will lead into her uh, setting the scene a little later. Then um, Marta Mendonca, I hope I got that, that uh, pronunciation more or less correct, um, from the Porto Protocol. And uh, Professor Armando Corsi from Adelaide Business School. So it's nice to, and thanks very much for being here so late at night. I know it's like uh, you said you're a bit of a night owl, but the, you know, there are limits to that. Um, and, and, <laughs> and then in the second half of our program uh, to Shelley Fuller from the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, to Nora uh, Sperling Teal from Delheim. So there are two Noras, um, one from Delheim and one from Longridge. So I'm just going to have to clearly differentiate, but people will get to know you hopefully by the end of the webinar. So before uh, I continue, I just want to hand over to uh, Dr. Edo Haynes, who seems to have frozen a bit on the picture there, um, uh, just to do a warm word of welcome. Edo, are you there? Oh dear, I think he's, he's frozen a little bit. So maybe we'll bring uh, Edo back in a second. Edo, give me a second. Okay. So just as a as an introduction, while we wait for Edo, oh there you are, Edo. Are you with us? I am back. I'm Hi back. Jonathan. Sorry, I lost That's the signal for, for a moment there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this very necessary and urgent discussion. Um, it happens at a time where climate change and environmental sustainability is central in terms of all facets of the wine value chain. Um, one example, exciting example of this is the viticulture research that Stellenbosch's very own Dr. Climate Change, um, Tara Selfie, is doing. Um, please refer to terraklim.co.za. It's an open source resource that winemakers can, can access and, and look at all the research in terms of planting for the future, um, real time climate data, and everything, of, um, and all this research is based around Stellenbosch and done at Stellenbosch University. In preparation for this study um, or for this session, I read through my own master thesis um, in which I studied the relevance and acceptance of green or sustainable wines in terms of wine marketing. And this was exactly a decade ago. And today this um, research topic sounds quite silly because sustainable wine production is not just accepted, but it's often expected, while well, no one can dispute the relevance of sustainable, sustainability in winemaking, whether you're producing large scale commercial wines or fine wines. So 10 years ago, many South African producers um, that I interviewed in my study championed a cause within the sphere of sustainability, whether it be organic production, light packaging, carbon neutrality, or even a specific cause like research about the endangered riverine rabbit. Today, wineries are required to take a much more holistic approach, whereby you're required to consider the entire value chain and the impact that and thereof on the environment. I'm actually sitting at Oa Tambo International Airport at the airport lounge now. And co coincidentally, I bumped into another winemaker here. And when I mentioned the panel discussion, he said that the challenge is often that organic production packaging credentials um, and the likes may not necessarily mean that you can add anything to your price, but that often a heavy bottle or a fancy case will do that. 
And I think in terms from a winemaker's perspective and from a wine industry perspective, um, that is very much our challenge. And we are therefore very grateful for the awareness on this topic and especially the awareness that um, Jancis has created around the topic. And without further ado, I would like to thank Jancis for, 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 for um, taking the time out to speak to us. And without further ado, hand it over to Jancis. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Well, it's such an enormous topic, isn't it, Edo? And thank you for putting it in perspective and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, it's so enormous that I must confess I'm not 100% certain how, how narrowly I should address it. Perhaps I could just quickly run over the various aspects of it. And I think um, I'm, oh, look, here's a, just a mis message come in. Dear Janice, great article in the FT, which was the one that I think that Jonathan has given most people a link to, which I published last Saturday about alternative ways of packaging wine. Um, I, I think I'm supposed to talk mainly about packaging, so I will. But probably um, it's worth just considering all aspects of sustainability. And, and I'm not going to go, I'm just going to give them some of the headings. Um, and I think we're probably all agreed that it is not enough just to try and use fewer pesticides and herbicides and all the rest. Um, there is a great move now um, towards regenerative viticulture, um, really looking into soil health and leaving your land in a better state that not sustaining the current state, but actually actively improving soil health and leaving your land in a better state than, than you uh, took it over in. Um, but also in terms of sustainability, we, we have to think about um, social sustainability. And I think that's probably very um, important in, in particularly in South Africa, the whole the workforce and um, making people happy to work for you. And of course, there's financial sustainability, um, and which is another very pertinent issue, I know, for South African wine producers. I've just been um, writing an article about the some of the best value wines available in the UK, and it's kind of shocking how many of them are from South Africa, but that won't be news to you. Um, and then, of course, there is, uh, and then there are, there are what you might think of as small issues, but that all add up to um, a sustainable future, which is, for instance, um, just your vehicles, you know, are they are they electric? Are they, are they gas guzzlers? And every time I know myself, I I've been trying to um, address my flying, and I think a lot of us are, are just uh, no longer just taking those flights without thinking of them, um, realizing just what they're doing to the planet. And I'm delighted. I think one of the few. Uh, positive effects of the awful COVID pandemic. Congratulations, incidentally, on your brilliant um, genome sequencing of the, the various variants. Um, uh, you know, it's the death of those people, of the execs who would just fly across the Atlantic for a business meeting and then fly back again. So all sorts of, of aspects of our lives we have to address. But I think I'm probably here to talk about wine packaging. And uh, it probably would be a good moment to show that slide that I shared with you, Jonathan. There. So this is an assessment of the carbon emissions from the various aspects of um, wine production. And you can see that um, the carbon emissions from actual production in the winery and the vineyard are surprisingly low they are not the chief components um yes it would be nice if uh, all wine producers captured the carbon that was carbon dioxide that was given off in fermentation but that is not going to make nearly as much um impact on the the planet's temperature as a dramatic uh, rethink on packaging and the reason that that packaging is such is responsible for 29% of wine's carbon emissions 
is the glass bottle. I think the glass bottle is wonderful. It is inert. It has served us well for centuries and is indubitably the best package for that percentage of wines which need cellaring. But that percentage of wines, as you all know, is actually pretty small and um, well under 10%, I would, I would argue. And there are strong arguments, both in terms of weight, uh, fragility, space, because the, the, the shape of a glass bottle is very, very wasteful of space, uh, for thinking seriously about other forms of, of packaging. And they are not all evil. There is even um, uh, a flat bottle made from recycled plastic, which um, somebody here is trying to get off the ground. We are all taught nowadays that, that plastic is evil, but if it is recycled PET, um, it is not necessarily evil if it is looked at in the whole round. So I would ask people to open their eyes, and I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by some of the wines that South Africans have been putting into cans, and I think there is a quite an argument for using cans for introducing people to wine, because when you think about it, um, you know, expecting a young person to invest in a 75 centiliter bottle that needs a special implement to get into, that's quite a commitment, it's quite expensive. Whereas uh, a little 25 centiliter can that you can just rip the top off of has quite a few advantages for introducing people to wine drinking. But my chief um, message is that the one thing that wine producers can do within months to make a difference is to A, educate consumers, which I agree is partly my job, uh, and, B, but, and B, abandon the really heavy bottle. I mean, I, and where I sit, and I write for the Financial Times, which is um, a global newspaper, and jancisrobinson.com, which is a global, um, has a global membership and, and readership, I can see consumer attitudes changing. And there is a, a growing cohort of wine drinkers who are not impressed by heavy bottles, who understand that heavy bottles are very expensive and uh, carbon emitting to both produce and transport, and um, are actually, favoring lighter bottles. You, uh, uh, OI, the glass manufacturer, is making a perfectly serviceable bottle that's now 300 grams, as opposed to some of the ones that come onto my tasting table, which can be approaching 1,000. Um, since February last year, I think it was, we weigh all full bottles before we taste the contents and we publish um, what they weigh so that we can point the finger at people who use unnecessarily heavy bottles and praise those who use light ones. And I was interested the other day, I found um, an empty bottle of uh, Chateau Latour 1982, the way you do, it must have been saved for a long time uh, on my sideboard. And it was just over 500 grams. It, you know, the, the first growths are actually not the sinners in this. It's, um, it's actually the sort of, lesser players who have to use something other than the quality of the wine to um, get people to pick their bottles off the shelf or, or the wine list. That's just a very, very brief introduction. And I've, I'm, it's so cursory, I'm ashamed. But um, uh, please feel free to ask questions or uh, add or, you know, um, develop this further. Dances, I, I, in fact, I have to, to questions or maybe a comment that you uh -huh. can just add to. The first is from Angela Lloyd, um, who asks, is the 29% relating to the glass bottle reflective of the lightest bottle available? I think it's reflective of, of an average because this study um, dates from a couple of years ago, I think, before the kind of movement towards light weighting bottles. Well, and that's, I think there was there's another question or two, isn't there, or comment or two? Yes, yes. So the next is from Peter von Nickak, is openness to new packaging is mostly driven by new wine drinkers with, with longer term drinkers more attached to the traditional 750 ml glass bottle. Of all the alternative boxed wine, 
does the best, especially five liter, with roughly one in four consumers have been, who've been drinking wine for regularly, uh, for regularly 10 years or less open to this packaging option. And I'm glad he uh, asked that from Dancer just before you, um, Amanda can also come in towards the end of the first segment to kind of round off. But Dancer, you want to, to tackle that? No, I'm, I'm all in favor of bag in box. I think it is, it, it's really uh, useful. It's very user friendly. I like the fact that there are some companies now specializing in putting better quality wine into bag and box. So it's, it's a, a genuine alternative for people who are interested in wine. And I take my hat off to the Nordic monopolies who've done such a great job to educate their consumers that heavy glass is not desirable and singing the, the virtues of bag in box packaging. Because I think it dominates, doesn't it? The, Swedish uh, market, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, can I, can I, add, I can think one point? Because actually I've not seen sort of statistics effectively about saying whether uh, the openness to this new format is actually driven by newcomers into the category or actually established ones. Because I think, I think that would be a very, very interesting study to conduct. But I don't, I don't, I don't think we have evidence because I guess in a very small sample of one, or at least also my friends who've been here in the category, and I think, you know, us discussing it today, I think we are all less scared about opening a wine that has been in a can compared to someone that maybe have a romantic idea about, for example, what the wine can be and what it can do and sort of the old standardization that also I can see addressed in one of the, in one of the comments. So, um, I, I think it would be a very interesting study to conduct in terms of who is actually more open um, uh, to the choice of, of alternative versus regular formats. I think some people who choose bag in box are doing it on um, a value basis. You know. uh, uh, Jansus, um, Ken Pogash, I, I hope I've got his pronunciation right, please address the roadblocks to standardization of bottle shape, weight, and mm. colors for the wine industry? Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, I, I, I dream of uh, a time when uh, areas with, with, with heavy wine consumption or, or um, concentrated wine consumption, should we say, and, and production areas like Stellenbosch would be very appropriate, have a returnable bottle. I mean, that would be great because if you ask consumers about glass bottles, they think they're great because they think they are all recycled. But of course, they're not. It all depends on where you are in the world. Um, there are various bits of Europe that are brilliant at recycling. Unfortunately, the UK isn't one of them. We all think we're being virtuous, putting our empty bottles into a recycle bin. But very few of us, including me, know precisely what happens to those bottles. Um, a point that I made at the weekend in my article was that I don't, you know, this great um, fashion for clear glass pale rosé. I don't think people realize that clear glass cannot be made from recycled glass. So you're automatically by choosing a clear glass bottle um, contributing to um, those carbon emissions in terms of, of production. Um, so uh, yes, I would love uh, a standard bottle. And I don't think, I mean, it, I think that, that we're just a thoughtful producer. And I, I would guess that wine drinkers are a, on average a little bit more thoughtful and intelligent than the average person. I think they're just gonna become more and more sustainability conscious. Nowadays, you would, you'd find very, very few wine drinkers who have the opportunity to put their empty bottles into a recycle bin, not putting them into the recycle bin. And I hope and think that they will be adopting more and more um, practices that are in line with sustainability, including in an area like Stellenbosch or Napa or Bordeaux, uh, where it wouldn't take a huge amount of, of um, uh, ingenuity to establish a returnable bottle scheme. Uh, and uh, incidentally, you. sorry, to the person, to your, the questioner, um, Miguel Torres in um, Catalonia, northeast Spain, 
who's really in the forefront of so many sustainability initiatives. Um, I believe that Tories are trying to initiate a standard bottle, returnable bottle scheme. And there is someone in Napa Valley who is trying to do the same thing. Maybe Marta can, um, can talk about that. Yeah, I'll talk about that. Regarding the, the scheme that Tories was involved in, that unless they are trying to reinitiate it, it was a project <coughs> called Rewind that lasted for four years. It finished about a couple of years ago. And it was a pilot that involved various wineries and various other stakeholders, with, uh, namely a, a, a bottle washing facility to try to see whether that worked. And they actually did a life cycle analysis on the whole process as well, which is very interesting. And I'll, I'll get more on that when, for sure. But, but okay. the fact that it stopped suggested it didn't work, right? It was not meant to continue because it was a pilot. It was a project that was financed by the European Union, if I'm not wrong. So uh -huh. it was made to start and to last. Uh, but the, we have actually, we can send you that report as well because we've been in touch with them. Thank you. And I'll tell you more about it in a second as well. Mm -hmm. um, can, can I uh, just pose one question because I'd like to start off with a uh, first team. Thanks so much, Jancis. Like There's so much valuable information embedded in what you've said, and I hope people are really going to reflect on, 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 on this. Um, so just the Stefano Ponti asked, on the one hand, the reluctance of some more traditional producers in France and Italy to put wine in alternative containers, e.g., uh, no Prosecco in cans, opens possibilities for more forward-looking producers. On the other hand, South Africa has struggled to take the path of premiumization, and alternative containers may further work against that. That's an incredibly important question, Jancis, because I think that's talking about balancing this economic and environmental purpose that people have. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I mean, in my eyes, I think about the South good South African wine in cans. Good on you. That's great. That, that to my mind, it, it creates a halo around South Africa. Um, but I do realize that, um, you know, a producer of Stellenbosch Cabernet is very wedded to their bottle. Um, but I, ju I just think the messaging could be so much clearer and that it, mm. it's going to catch up with the wine business if... Um, they continue to lean on heavy bottles, which have a, many of them have a massive um, journey, both to the producer and to the, then to the consumer. Uh, Argentina is, is, a, is a sinner in this respect. Um, but the message is getting through in California, which is good, because they've had some really heavy bottles, haven't they? But um, it is, it's lightening up. So I don't think this... It, you know, a heavy bottle, you might be able to lean on a heavy bottle for premiumization for a year or two or maybe even three, but I don't think it's a sustainable long term proposition, given the fact I'm not going to shut up about it. And my <laughs> <laughs> and my um, fears are, are not that I'm saying I'm, you know, running the wine world, but I mean, for instance, the um, Eric Asimov in the uh, New York Times, I think he devoted an article to it the other day. Um, there are kind of um, uh, petitions on Twitter, you know, I mean, a lot of opinion leaders are, are ahead of the curve on this. Thank, thank you, Jansa. So um, I, I think we, we zoomed in first. Um, I think we started with a zoom out and we zoomed in and now we're going to zoom out again, I think, uh, and have a sort of helicopter view because we need to understand environmental sustainability as a grand societal challenge, which it's not only confronted by the wine industry, but we, we need to play our part and we need to make sure that our, our house is, is clean. And what happens in the next uh, centuries depends on what we do in this decade. I think it's a, a crucial listening to a whole lot of docu seeing a, a documentary, reading some, some articles, if we don't year on year substantially reduce carbon emissions, uh, the, the window for reversing it will be forever close to us. And so we really need to um, not focus on economic growth, but focus fully on environmental sustainability. 
um, and to look at a model um, that our whole growth model encompasses sustainability. And I think that that's sort of something that's percolating underneath what's what's happening. But it's also the that we need to, um, and the purpose of this webinar is really firstly to inform, and it's wonderful to have thought leaders like Jancis, Marta, and all the rest of our panel um, coming to talk, because it creates a kind of uh, collective effort and also inspires urgency to really solve these grand challenges which are complex and the more you scratch into them the more problems are unearthed um, and so i would like to focus on uh, zooming out a little bit on carbon emission climate change and no better person to do it than marta um, and then we're going to zoom back in with amanda and jancis having a bit of uh, 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 a chat um, and it'll be interesting to see from the research side um, that the research that Armando and his colleagues in Australia are doing, and we'll post the links to some of that on alternative packaging um, in, in terms of the market. So um, over to you, Marta. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, first of all, all, for being here. It's a pleasure to travel to South Africa with no carbon emissions, which is amazing. And when I think of carbon, when I think of environmental sustainability, again, as you said it very well, I think of our Eagle's Eye, you call it helicopter, we call it Eagle's Eye, because as an organization, we act as a knowledge sharing community. So we have companies and we speak to companies of every size, every stage of climate path from every wine region. We have quite a few members from South Africa and we are partnering, partnering with you. Um, and also, um, so that gives us a, a really good view of what's happening, not only in terms of solutions, but in terms of impacts and trends. And so uh, I think I sort of summarized to five topics, if I'm not wrong, what we see most of all in terms of challenges. And the first one is water, by far water. And I'm not talking about water shortage. And if there's one thing you know as a country is water shortage, because you've probably experienced it in the most extreme fashion, probably more than most countries out there. Although we can see it everywhere from Portugal, where we are based as an organization, we, where we are experiencing drought at the moment. California is experiencing it as well. but. We also have to look from a water footprint standpoint. So it's not about only the scarcity of water, but how much we are consuming, and that's key. For example, um, the New, New Zealand wines really measure everything. And I know that's one of the topics that you want to, to mention uh, further in this conversation. But so for example, they know for a fact that their industry spends an average of 150 liters of water per liter of wine. Now, this is scandalous in every possible way. It's huge. So yes, carbon emissions, and we'll talk about them, are key. But water is water is life. So, and with every producer we speak all over the world, water is the main issue. Sometimes because they're spending it too much, because they're irrigating too much, sometimes because they have it enough and so they don't measure it, they don't manage it, they don't spend it mindfully. So in every possible way, and be, water is by far the biggest um, challenge wine producers that we speak of all over the world face. Then there's carbon emissions. And then when we think of carbon emissions, as Jancis put it out loud, we, we cannot not speak about packaging. Uh, but we speak about packaging not only because the glass bottle is the biggest um, carbon emitter of the whole wine life cycle. But again, as Jensis said, because we're not even doing the basic, which is recycling bottles. So we have countries such as, for example, fin Finland that has 90% recycling rates, but a country such as the US, where you have one of the biggest wine uh, producers in the world is, and I do not want to go wrong with the numbers, but I would say that it's an average of 30%. So before we even think of, as we are as an organization, rethinking of accelerating the implementation of reusable bottle schemes, we are not even doing the basics. So there's so much we have to do, not only as wine producers, but policies need to change in order to address this basic need. 
And then, of course, um, as we reach out for the stars, and that's something that we're doing as an organization, we are indeed trying to accelerate identifying, bringing together all reusable bottle schemes out there, namely trying to accelerate uh, uh, as, uh, and I, I know more about it, although we still have a lot to do in regards to trying to accelerate this in Napa. So there's a lot to do with packaging. Also, not just reusing, but also reducing and looking at hidden waste in packaging. As Jens has said, stoppers, uh, the labels that, in, for example, in the US, they're not washable. Looking at, for example, uh, and you have an amazing example in South Africa, which is the hidden waste, such as shrink wrap, where you have, for example, and I know we have many producers from South Africa, but for example, Bruce Jack is using uh, biodegradable shrink wrap. So let's not forget the, that there, there is more to packaging than the one we, that the bottle we see on the shelf. Luckily, and one of the issues here was talking about prime um, fine wines. There's a huge, an amazing example coming from the US going into boxed wine, which is Tavos Creek. I invite you to, to see because he builds a really amazing case on why uh, he should have any, he did launch uh, boxed wine for $95. But moving on to what you asked, Pest management is another issue. And not just because about the chemicals. This brings us to several conversations. It goes, for example, to, to do with economic, economic sustainability because many of the producers out there, most of them are just looking to live for the day. I mean, they're not even thinking of how they're going to live the, 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 the land for the next generation because they're just trying to survive. And the more chemicals they use, the more yield they'll have. So. Again, we can never look at sustainability just from one dimension because they're so interconnected. And then we have this, this, um, this connection between, on one hand, we're using chemicals that has a less uh, carbon footprint. And on the other hand, if we go for organic, we're talking about carbon that is a, also a heavy uh, metal, along with more passages needed with the tractor, therefore increasing the carbon footprint. So this is so... This is, this is such a complicated uh, question to go to. And then biodiversity. In most, uh, most producers we know, this brings, us to, brings me two examples. One, for example, that has to do with my last point, which is education from an, an environmental sustainability standpoint, which is biodiversity loss, which we know is a huge challenge, just as climate change, like water shortage. And when we think of wine producers, we think of monocrops. I'm not sure if this is the perfect expression in English. So we look at an estate and all of it is full of crops. And so we need to start thinking besides, besides just the vineyards and thinking of the, heck, the ecosystem as a whole and how we can promote it and, and safeguard it for the future. And thinking again uh, of pest management, management and biodiversity. Uh, for example, one of the trends we see, and it's a very important one, is cover, cover crops. But on the other hand, we see many producers, and we speak to many small ones that are far away from this, uh, their concern when, when it comes to an environmental sustainability of thinking that their neighbor, if they have a cover crop, for example, will think that they are not taking care of their their vineyard. So this brings me to the last point, which is education and awareness. And it's not just about educating others. We have spoken to many producers that don't even know that the bottle is by far the biggest contributor to their carbon footprint. Or as I said, they think that they their cover crop is an insult and will uh, spoil their reputation, or that they think they don't have enough power to influence their supplier because they're too small. So it's about education, our own education, education of the consumers, education of the supply chain and raising awareness. So I think as a point, I think this is hopefully I was able to give you an eagle's eye view on what we're seeing. That's a great point. And I'm glad you mentioned education, but maybe we just get uh, Jancis's view before that. I've got a couple of questions, but I want, uh, Maybe Amanda to come in. Are you are you fine there, Jen? Um, yeah, I just lap it all up. I think it's a um a very all, you know, absolutely on the point. 
on the on the button. I've got uh, two questions, so we'll uh, we'll let Armando talk a little bit about his research, um, and then I think it's uh, two questions that I think uh, that uh, all three panelists can maybe uh, give their perspective on. But I had a long chat to Armando um, the other day and was very interested to see his research and especially on there's a platform called Pacwine. Uh, Raf will post the, the link there for just to have a look on various topics related to wine packaging. But uh, Armando, over to you. Um, uh, Absolutely. And, and it's, it's not just on the wine packaging side. Um, and going into the next theme, which is looking at adapting to climate change, conservation, and sustainable farming. Absolutely. Um, yes. So, oh, over to you, uh, Armando. Per per perfect, Jonathan. Well, again, like like Martha before, thank you for for inviting me. It's really great to be with you all, uh, with you all today. Um, I guess the the way in which I would like probably to to structure my my five minutes talk, I guess, is is. It's looking really at the idea of how much in a very short time, really, we've seen a growth in terms of consumer attention towards uh, sustainability, environment, alternative packaging. I, I, I was looking and I remember, you know, the studies that we were doing sort of back in 2007, 2008. And, you know, th there was a long time where there was a very sort of scarcity around uh, studies around consumer research on environmental sustainability, environmental friendliness around uh, around wine. And then in the last few years, really things are starting to, uh, to pick up. Uh, the, the other point that I would like to make, uh, which I think leads and sort of prepares hopefully for the results that I'm going to show you. I think we always have to remember very carefully when we talk about uh, research in uh, conducting a survey, uh, administering a survey with, with consumers or with trade, that the way in which we ask the questions influence tremendously uh, the kind of results that we get. Because if you ask a question on sort of a Likert scale, sort of one to seven or sort of a ranking scale, everything has the tendency to become important. And I think that has been a bit of a bias of previous research that we've seen in the area of, of environmental friendliness, sustainability, um, whilst that is really not the way in which we, people choose we always have to make trade-offs between things. And with that idea, you know, when we are in front of a shelf, we can't pick as much as we'd love to, everything and every wine that we like, but we have to make a choice, determined by our preferences, determined by our budget. And so with that in mind, that's sort of our, uh, I guess, starting point for, uh, for the study that uh, my, one of my students, uh, Jacob Mercedes, uh, with my co-authors, uh, and his supervisors, uh, Larry Lockshin, Justin Cohen, and, and Bill Page. We conducted a study uh, with Australian consumers. Uh, last year, we had uh, approximately 1,200 consumers, so 1,200 uh, respondents, uh, to whom we administered a survey using a technique called discrete choice experiments. Uh, discrete choice experiments are effectively a technique where you give people various options that people have to uh, choose among so you you know you, you have maybe two or three in our case there were three options uh, that we sort of manipulating things such as the type of format the price points the uh, the kind of messages around recyclability environmental friendliness uh, and so and so on and by manipulating and giving people these choices by asking them how and which uh, format they would choose the most and which wine they would choose the most uh, we are able to come up with a sort of ranking of what it matters the most. And the results of our research are showing that format is really a driver of choice. But in saying that, uh, we have to remember that we included the traditional glass bottle as one of the formats that we used. And it might come to no surprise to you that whilst obviously uh, we see a growth in terms of the, of the choice of alternative packaging, uh, particularly when we compare it to a few years before, uh, the traditional glass bottle is still the, the, the dominating format that people choose. When they have the choice, still the choice go predominantly on the regular glass bottle. I think a few interesting results, however, for us have been the following. First of all, that um, uh, when we're looking at the second and third most uh, valuable format, we saw that the flat wine bottle uh, beat the can. 
Uh, not by much, but the flat wine bottles seem to have a preference, at least with Australian consumers, over cans. The other factor to consider is that the majority of the population, so about 58% of our consumers, also seem to have about a 20% of importance in, the, in overall for also the messages that come with uh, the format that you would expect to sort of carry more the environmental friendly a friendly message, but that means there is still a 42% of uh, Australian consumers, for example, that really do not care about, uh, about that topic. So I think there is a journey to go. Uh, another interesting consideration I think that we found is that we really did not see huge differences based on the classic social demographic characteristics of the population. So in terms of gender, age, um, and I think this is another important point because what we see more and more when it comes to segmentation, segmenting the population is the idea that we have to segment more based on what people choose. So what we call more the psychographic characteristic and the actual behavior of people, rather than just looking into the sort of the old millennials like this or baby boomers like that. I think the, the differences that we see in population are, are really going way beyond, uh, if you like, the the biology of people, whether it's age, gender, and in some way, probably uh, probably also income. So yeah, I think in, in probably to summarize, I think an important point is I think we are on a journey. Uh, one of the things that I believe we should actually investigate more moving forward is the whole idea of not just looking into the choice per se, but what kind of communication messages, what kind of influence, what, what can we do to change behavior? So whether, for example, is a message about innovativeness, a message about, again, environmental friendliness, something else that says, look, how, how can we go from A to B? Uh, because I think that is going to be an important evaluation in terms of uh, what is the profitability of, of changing as well, so that we do things not just because they're good, but also because there is a positive return on investment on our choices. But also the other thing I think to consider that our staff, it was a study done on consumers and that is only one side of the coin uh, so we have obviously people like james is smart etc will keep on writing and not stopping about saying to also the trade about what they should do but i think if i can use the analogy with what happened in australia again back in the 70s with the introduction of screw caps is that all of a sudden producers out of clear valley said this is how we're going to borrow our reasoning that's the the only format available in terms of closure and people sort of got along with it. If they wanted to buy Riesling from Claire, that's pretty much the, the, the format, the kind of closure that you can use, that they can use. So I think in many ways we have to wait or wait or sort of push also have a, not just a consumer driven push, but a producer driven push and also from the retailer to say, look, you know what? From now on, this is how we're gonna borrow, uh, this is how we're gonna borrow, this is how we're gonna package our wines. And, and I believe people are, are going to get um, to pick that up. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. Um, Jancis and Marta, you want to comment on that? Or can I run through a couple of questions which... Uh, oh, no, 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 go, go. Can I ask one question? Yes. Armando, when, when you um, try to understand the consumer's preference in regards to, uh, to bottle formats, does it say, for example, does it is there any relationship between the glass bottle and quality, or is just or do you just ask in general whether they prefer the the glass bottle, the what bottle? Well, we so we 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 standardize actually on the volume. So the, we say, look, you you can buy uh, either option one, option two, or option three. It's manipulated, but effectively we say, look, you can buy fifteen hundred. 1.5 liters 1500 ml worth of product at different price points uh we didn't say the wine is better or worse we say it is the same wine which you can buy in different formats so actually one of the factors one of the um one of the factors that we that we manipulated is brands and we manipulated brands in terms of popularity and level of premiumness of of different brands um but people had the option to to choose between brands and, and quality. Uh, 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 I guess we the way in which we use quality is, 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 is through price. That price was a proxy for, for quality. 
but we didn't use in this specific case sort of expert ratings on the wines, which is something that in, in other studies we've done that. I have a, a question here from Andre Morgenthal from the Old Vine Project. I might have mentioned them. Um, and their, their focus is really on differentiation and um, th th they've managed to achieve a relatively high premium on their wine. Um, and he says, uh, what is the view on premium wines in alternative packaging, like old vine wines? Jancis, maybe you can jump well, in here. Well, well, I would say that most of the, um, the, the wines that Andre is uh, so uh, cleverly promoting probably do deserve aging and are in the category that that should and need a, an inert glass bottle because most of the alternative packages are fine for wine that's kept for maybe two years which does cover a heck of a lot of wine that's consumed today but uh, i'm sure that the old vine uh, produce you want to you want to have the ability to to keep it for longer than that. So all I'm asking for in that case is just being aware of lighter weight bottles. I think the bottle is still the right package for serious wine. Yeah, Jensen, I think you answered two questions in one because the, the next uh, one was how sustainable packaging influences bottle maturation. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, you, 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 it, you know, we're, we're talking, A, go for a lighter bottle if, if, your wine is serious and most producers think their wine is serious but b consider alternatives which are much lighter and better for the planet if it's a, a wine for early consumption which most wines are um so then we have a, a, a question from ken again do you believe that the messages from the wine industry on label um, on labels are confusing due to consistent definitions of sustainability, natural wine, et cetera. Do you believe that consumers perceive uh, sustainable on a label as greenwashing, maybe? Marta probably has a view here. I would just- Yeah, Marta, in. let's hear from you. Oh, Jens is gone, I'll, I'll answer yeah, that. I'll just quickly <laughs> say, I, I think sadly, the term sustainable has become degraded and uh, it covers a multitude of sins. There is a heck of a lot of greenwashing and um, uh, a lot of um, stuff that's described as sustainable is, is done for marketing reasons rather than out of a genuine conviction that, that we've got to get those, save the planet and get those uh, temperatures down, sadly. So uh, I'd, I'd like to- cynical, maybe... but Marta probably would, would have something to add here. Yes, Marta, sorry. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jancis. First, I'd like to say two things before answering. First, uh, sustainability, sustainability got into our normal daily vocabulary without even we even knowing what it means, most of us. So that's dangerous. And the second thing is we are in the danger, as from where we stand, of having regenerative go into exactly the same path. I actually uh, read the word regenerative washing. I think that was it. <laughs> and in fact, I think we, we're going the same path. Okay, so maybe regenerative might be a little more intuitive than sustainability. Both are absolutely key. Sustainability is still key. And we cannot ditch it just because we need more awareness. We just need to work on the awareness rather than just ditching it aside because it's still a key a concept just as is regenerative. You just have to be aware. Again, it's all about education and behavioral change, isn't it? Now, regarding Ken's question, thank you, Ken. I think we don't necessarily go into greenwashing, might not necessarily go, go into greenwashing. Again, we need awareness because there are too many stamps, too many certifications, and the consumer does not know the difference. And it's, but we can get into greenwashing when the stamp comes, and we've seen that, is produced by the, the producer itself. So some producers just create a beautiful icon illustrated that means something and you can just look at it and think, oh, this must be some sort of certification. So yes, there is that danger, but there is the danger also of the consumer sometimes not knowing that organic does not mean sustainable. Natural wine does not mean sustainable. And when we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about environmental, financial, and social. 
this is when we uh, in encounter uh, a sustainability production approach, not when we see fair trade or organic. So actually, I think the answer to Ken after all is yes. Sorry, I went around. <laughs> Um, I, I think I, what I'd like to do, because we're running out of time for the session and uh, and to move on to our new theme, we could probably talk uh, on this for an entire morning, but maybe just to get a high level summary from our absolutely amazing panel and amazing introduction to this, I think everybody is just absorbed. Um, and uh, there's one question which I think was from uh, Stefano Ponti was do you think that that it's possible for the Stellenbosch winery to solve the problem of not too many certifications and not too many and overdoing it um, and is there a fine balance uh, are we talking about a fine balance or is it ultimately about blended value and what the consumer wants who would like to tackle that i'm happy to try to explain why I can't answer it before I'm afraid I have to leave you. And I'm very sorry, but maybe I can, um, I can look at the recording of the second half. Um, I'm afraid I don't know the ins and outs of SWR. Um, maybe it's just, it's yet another certification. And I think from the consumer's point of view, which is the way I always look at, at anything to do with wine, uh, a really good dispassionate guide to all the certifications is sorely needed. Um, and um, I think that's that's all I have to add on that. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, Thanks so much, Jancis. Um, thank you. I'll hand over to the rest, but thank you so much for being here today. Before, thank you, Jancis. Um, uh, for being part of this conversation. Really Pleasure. wonderful to well, have let, you on. Let's hope there's some effect and that uh, everyone's taken my nagging in thank you <laughs> thanks Francis. um uh, jonathan can i i think if i can add the point i think it's 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 probably going to go back to a concept that we were talking before which is the idea of really what wine are we talking about i mean we know uh, we know that there is over 90 percent at least these are stats from from the us over 90 percent of the wine that is purchased is consumed within two weeks of purchasing right so I think that the whole point is become what kind of wine you are producing, right? So you're producing, you know, a wine to be seller for 20 years. I don't think it's the case, but that's, that's really the minority of the products that we're making. And the point is, if you're making a Pinot Gris, if you're making a soft blanc, if you're making something that is meant to be drank within a certain number of years, probably within one or, or even less, these are, I think, the kind of wines that I think are more prone to the idea of being uh, to be to be bottled, to be packaged in, in formats other than uh, than the glass bottle. And with that saying, even for those that stay for long, I'm not advocating for heavy bottles at all, though. Armando, let me just add, that's exactly what I was going to ask you. Does a, a wine that needs bottling need a heavy bottle rather than a lighter one? No. So, Absolutely. I mean... So even no, no. though I'm, but I'm even a, a lighter bottle. No, 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 not every bottle. I guess what I'm saying is we, we I think we still don't know a lot about what what are the long-term effects of keeping a wine not just in a in an heavy glass, but just in a format other than glass. Even if we put it in a bagging box, could a first grow Bordeaux in a bagging box last 20 years? That I think we don't have that evidence yet to say, let's put that kind of wine in a bagging box. What I'm saying is the, a, a, a traditional bottle that doesn't have to be heavy, I think for certain type of wines could still be the way to go. But those wines are only a minority of, all the, of the entire worldwide production. So let me now that we're here and you're mentioning that let me challenge everyone out there and all those all the Stellenbosch producers that are listening to us to think about a few very simple rules rules and, and the first one is really question question everything question whatever single use plastic you, you're using in your bottle question the size and the the, the, the amount of references you need for outer box cases, for example, how many references do you have? Why not have one, one case, for example, one outer case for all your wines, if you can. Think standardization of everything you can, can question. Talk to 
the, the supplier where you print your labels and where you print your outer case. If you're actually, you are actually using all the paper that you can. We, I say this because we have a member of ours from the US that did just this. He went to his supplier and questioned everything that he was printing on. And he was able to reduce significantly the amount of cards that he was using for his outer cases. So really do question. Do question if, or speak, question your importer in the UK, for example, if he really needs such a, a heavy bottle, for example, or if he's willing to go for other, or, uh, other, um, other containers, for example, or if his consume, their consumers, your consumers are asking, for other formats. So reduce, reuse, rethink, uh, recycle. Uh, there's, if you just have these simple rules in mind, it really can contribute to behavioral change because it's really about, and you said it, Armando, it's really about behavioral change, not just top bottom, but everyone from your consumer to your supplier, to everyone in your value chain, really, everyone can contribute. And one of the things that we see, and I, I get this a lot in conversa conversations, not just about wine. If we really take climate change into play, if we really bring it to the conversation, which most of the times it doesn't, the fact is we'll see things from another lens, which is absolutely key for us to rethink everything that we're doing because it's not just because consumers want it or we want it because we are all consumers at the end of the day. It's because we know for a fact, then this is not Santa Claus, this is science that is telling us that we have to rethink the way we, we produce everything. So it's, 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 it's a reality. It's not even a, a suggestion. It's, science as a whole has said this, has proved that this is this to be true. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Sure. There's so much knowledge in that. I think what we're going to ask Marta to hang around a little bit. And unfortunately, I know it's what, like one in the morning, but I just want to think about Oh, shit. Are you teaching tomorrow? I hope not. No. <laughs> okay. No, I'm not, but I have a two-year-old. Uh, oh, now, dear. So I just okay. don't know what time so, so I just want you to mention for one minute. Thank you, Marta. We'll, um, I think it'll be great to involve you um, uh, in, in the next one, uh, next uh, little bit of discussion. But just to link to, to the question I want to ask Shelley from the WWF, is you're doing some, some work on how do we manage climate change? or adapt to climate change by uh, so maybe just share a little like a one minute snap on the research that you're doing on on that side okay well thanks very much this has no, been no, a I, very uh, oh, oh sorry interesting uh, to oh, so, sorry i just wanted to say to 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 amando just a one minute and then i'll come back to you to okay Shirley. never I will. okay no worries no worries just one minute Who? Amanda? Uh, go for it, Amanda. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry. Amanda. Sorry, Jonathan. What would... Uh, then I'll then let I you go. Understand. Just your, your research on varietal mix and adapting to... Ah, absolutely. Food. I apologize. I, did, I didn't get that. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yes. The, the, another part of research that we are conducting now is about consumer acceptance towards what we, we started to refer more here in Australia, not as alternative grape varieties, but emerging grape varieties, which might be just a subtle... Uh, terminology meaning but I think we, we are starting to talk more about not something that you do as alternative to the mainstream but as a way that we see a series of great varieties that are that are emerging we've seen uh, in Australia particularly in the last four to five years a growth of mostly um, Italian grape varieties but not only those ones but surely we've seen a growth in the likes, for example, of Nebbiolo, Nero Davola, uh, Sangiovese, Dolcetto, Barbera, uh, Aianico, uh, a series of grape varieties that are obviously very, uh, probably more suitable to, to, to the Australian climate. And what we're seeing is from a sensory perspective, uh, there are some uh, um, similarities, I guess, that we have between the traditional mainstream grape varieties and the uh, emerging uh, grape varieties. What we are trying to obviously focus more now and on two aspects. On the one side, uh, sort of similar to what I was saying before, 
what is the appetite for trade operators, whether it's in retail, on-premise and on-premise, so restaurant, cafes and bar, to switch from the likes of Shiraz, Cabernet, Grenache, et cetera, Chardonnay, to emerging grape varieties, because again, these are the gatekeepers that are gonna put those wines on the various list. Um, and the second one is where well, we know that the, from the intrinsic characteristics point of view, we can have some similarities. So we can say to people, if you like Shiraz, this is another great variety that you can get. Uh, but if you don't, but we know that this is only one part of the story, uh, pronunciation, okay? So for me, saying Sangiovese, it's easy, but I hear lots of people that are not even able to say that. So, and there is, there is a concept of, of uh, sort of what we've been referring in Australia as regional heroes. So the, for, for a long time, we've had this notion of uh, Shiraz grows best in areas like Barossa and McLaren. Uh, Riesling grows best in areas like Clairvalley, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So how are we able to change those perceptions in terms of, well, actually, Nero Davola can grow amazingly well in McLaren Vale and sort of creating that link in the mind of consumers that various regions of Australia can become known for emerging grape varieties. This is going to be the other challenge uh, that, we, that we will invest on uh, in the next few years. Thanks, thanks so much, Amanda. So, and I'll let you get back to, to sleep. And uh, it's a great counterpoint because I think what uh, hopefully Shelley is going to talk a little bit about is, is not necessarily adapting to climate change. So how do we um, con confront it and, 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 and change the direction and, and talk a little bit about conservation biodiversity, which we're going to talk a little bit about in this section and then a little bit on uh, sustainable farming. But thanks so much for being up so late and for sharing it's some brilliant insights with, with us. Keep well. It's a pleasure. It's and great. Have a good rest of the webinar. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Over to you, Shelley. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, it's been an incredibly interesting um, discussion. So um, thank you for pulling it together and thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, in, in South Africa, um, I mean, a lot of this has already been covered, but I think um, in terms of confronting climate change, I mean, the title in itself, um, we're fortunate that for the fruit and wine industry, there's been an initiative now that was started in 2008, so over 10 years old, almost 15, um, gathering data about carbon footprints for the fruit and wine industry. So initiated by the fruit and wine industries themselves, recognizing that we've got to get a handle on measuring and monitoring um, where the big hotspots are through, through the value chain. Um, and then also being able to proactively respond um, to the market. Um, but I think what's most important, and you heard it through the, through the discussion, is for us all to understand what those numbers mean. Um, you know, one carbon footprint uh, cannot equally be compared to another unless you're using the same credible standard. Um, so I think that conversation on, uh, on greenwashing is also a really important one um, to follow on because it really is important for consumers who we're seeing now are becoming more and more conscious about their choices um, and more critical, you know, to ask those difficult questions and to check what it means behind this logo um, and to really be able to use their power of purchase to support those that are doing um, far more than, um, than just kind of uh, the legislation requires. So I do think we need to we need to always look at improving and, and upping the game. But I think if we just look at um, the carbon footprint as one lens, it's certainly not going to be shifting up how we how we're adapting to climate change or even how we're recognizing, you know, the innovation beyond just just looking at the carbon lens. So Marta, you mentioned water being one of the highest risks. Um, I mean, here in South Africa. Your, the big carbon footprint at a farm level is related to irrigation for pumping um, from, from dams, bodies of water into your vineyards. But there's been so much innovation um, that is really, it's not easily seen unless you tell those stories. Um, so I think in South Africa, you know, we are farming 
um, particularly in the wine industry, where 90% of the wine is grown in critical biodiversity hotspots. You know, in the Cape Floral Kingdom, it's overlaid with pretty much exactly where our top quality wine comes from in the country. So these farmers are the custodians, the stewards of, of the water and the soil. Um, and I think that's really important and, and something that we as WWF are trying to promote is to say, let's recognize some of the challenges and, and standardize the approach to measuring. And, and there are some incredible standards in the wine industry, like the integrated production of wine and the Porto Protocol as well, that a lot of signatories have, have joined. Um, so let's keep those um, going and strengthen them not develop more and more and more and and also recognize kind of those that are taking it beyond so so we work with some with about 55 wine farms and uh, Nora from Delheim is one of them called the conservation champions and these farms are leading the way in terms of environmental best practice you know that we spoke about um regenerative being overused now from sustainability but it really is it's farming with biodiversity and I think that's the shift we have to get through to the consumer that it's not just the product that you purchase in the store it's how it's made how it's made to support nature to restore the soils to bring the health back to the system because for too long we've just been taking too much out of the system and so now we're in this predicament and the, the problem is um, that there is just too much information out there for the consumer. So I think, you know, the sustainable wine round table and the Porter, Porter protocol, there's excellent standards that are there and need to be adopted and promoted because otherwise the consumer is just going to go for the shiniest sticker on a bottle and, and, and we have to drive that, that, um, critical mass that understands what's behind the logo and asks those questions and and supports these farms that are doing doing far more than than what is required um, because otherwise we're not going to be able to incentivize that kind of shift you know it's it takes a level of commitment and passion to be able to change the way you're doing your business and I do believe the South African farms are I mean they farmers realize they no other industry is so reliant on nature's resources. Um, so I think that farmers are inherently adaptable, but I think the market plays an enormous role in terms of getting the pricing right and in terms of incentivizing um, that shift. So yeah, I, I think um, there's probably a couple of other points, but maybe we want to open to some more questions. Wait, you're, you're muted, Jonathan. Um, I, I see Marta's made a, a, a comment about the carbon funnel. Mm. I'm not sure what that is. Not being. Can I I'm show not... a slide? Just one slide. Just to uh, what sure, it... sure. Can I, if you let me? Uh, and... If you can share it. Can no, you I can't. It? No. Uh, I'm not sure how to allow you. Don't but... worry then. I was going to show you what the, that carbon funnel was actually. Uh, because that's one of the that was one of the messages I had for this. Um, okay, now I can. Okay, just actually I had a slide here that was the same agencies. The carbon funnel is this. Can you mm. see my screen? Yes. Can you see the carbon funnel? Ah, so okay. when you, we just think of, and it's very much in line with what Shelley said. When we just have the carbon emissions, which is something that is growing tremendously in the the wine industry we lose hindsight of so many important things, namely social crisis, water crisis, biodiversity loss, so just overconsumption. So just to, so it's really important that we think holistically and think of everything that we are contributing to, uh, not only in our industry, but as a whole. It's just, just to add on what, what uh, Shelley was Brilliant. saying. That's what the carbon funnel is. Wow, I tell you, I'm learning so much uh, here today. Uh, Shelley, um, yes. Uh, what about uh, 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 monocultures, which a lot mm. of vineyards are? What is your perspective on that? Because the, the little I know about uh, botany is we've got one of the most diverse fl floral kingdoms in the world. Mm. Um, so maybe just comment on what you think about monoculture. I've read a few uh, books of very famous um, 
uh, guys like Masanobu Fukuoka swore about this uh, integration between culture and, and nature. I don't know if that's the kind of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, look, I mean, if we're trying to produce the, the quantity of food, never mind wine, but the quantity of food to feed the 9 billion people we've got going on, um, we do need to start looking very much more holistically and and we need to be starting to put back into the system. And so monoculture, yes, has, has evolved since the industrial revolution because it's, it's an easier way to farm and to get more out than, than um, off, a, off a relatively smaller um, scale. But the way that, that the farming system is shifting, um, mostly because the inputs are so much more expensive now, everything fossil fuel based, whether it's diesel in your tractor or um, chemical fertilizers is becoming more and more expensive. Um, but also because um, the more you take out of the system, the more expensive it is to replace it. So I think um, we are seeing in the vineyard certainly that it isn't that barren ground between the vines. It is um, the use of cover crops and, and mulch and bringing the life back in between the vineyards. So you know, some farms are even bringing um, the Feinbos, the biodiversity, back in between um, the vineyards and the orchards. And Dalheim and others are doing that exactly and seeing the, the results in terms of, you know, how those natural systems um, require much less over time because they, they provide the buffer. And that's what I wanted to say earlier, that actually biodiversity, the diversity of, of biological life, is the biggest buffer to climate change. I mean, if you see the impact of healthy soils, um, surviving the drought that, that the Western Cape that South Africa had, um, just because they're able to, to hold the water that much more and, and the loss of evaporation is much less if there is life in the soil, if there is a cover, if it's not barren land. So I think, you know, that shift is happening. Uh, you never waste a good crisis. So the drought certainly has, has taught us all of that. But, um, but also I think the cost of input is, is playing a huge role in terms of people being very efficient with what they're doing um, and starting to value those, those natural systems, you know, um, bringing nature back in. But I saw there was also a question of how we start bringing the positive side of carbon, healthy carbon levels in the soil. Can we start getting to a point where that's part of the equation? And yes, absolutely, that's what we're trying to shift. Not only looking at the emissions that result from farming and logistics to get the product to market, but what is the good side of things? So what is the, the positive side of a healthy soil? How do you measure the soil carbon and, and use that to offset against what it takes to get the product to market? I don't thank want to take up all the airways. No, no, th th thank you. <laughs> thank Shelley, like really salient points there, brilliantly articulated. And I think it's a perfect time to bring Nora Dalheim in because there's two Noras. Just to talk a little bit about, about, about the Simonsburg Constituent uh, Conservancy um, and a little bit about what you do in terms of stewardship, um, because I know you're very passionate about it. It's really a collective effort that a lot of people get to. And what, how does Dalheim sort of fit into that ecosystem of, 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 of collective effort? Thanks, Jonathan. And um, thanks, Shelley, for sticking around with WWF for the wine industry. Um, yeah, I, I'm speaking on behalf of the Simonsburg Conservancy, which um, I've been the chairperson for the last 15 years. Every year when we have our meetings, no one else puts up their hand, and I'm very passionate about conservation. Uh, we've grown from five members in 2001, and we are 30 members on the Simonsburg today, um, a well-managed uh, public benefit organization, nonprofit. And if it wasn't for the WWF sticking around to help us through how to link the wine industry with conservation, we wouldn't be around. And I think the work that um, shelley has been doing with us to take that message to the market has become even more important. We just keep on doing it, but we forget to tell and share our stories. And um, I appreciate the fact that we get these opportunities to share a little bit of what we're doing. Um, and I think there's just so much more we could be doing if we, if we could 
get the funding model right because nobody's going to give extra money for the fact that we're doing conservation efforts. So um, one of the concerns I have is the impact of the growing wine tourism into conservation areas and how do we manage um, noise pollution, light pollution, the impact of people in the conservation areas in a way that will preserve um, the value for the animals, the uh, plants and um, give value back to the consumer in a way that's, that's sustainable. So at the moment we keep on running a conservancy um, and everybody's just doing their own thing, but uh, I think the long term would be a more sustainable effort is more conservation um, practices being rolled out with not just us being a conservancy, but with WWF and the consumer understanding what we're actually doing on the ground. Um, and yeah, thanks um, Shelley once again for, for even the Cape Wine doing the sustainable WWF um, stand for us. Um, every time we are able to send the message to the market, we're doing a, a better job. I do also find the big education that we do for the farmers. Um, people are not aware that alien clearing is part of um, legal, um, the removal of aliens on properties as part of um, the Department of Environmental Affairs Act. Uh, every farm that has aliens on their property needs to have a conservation management plan in place and prove that they're actually doing something about it. If they sell the property and they do not have a conservation management plan in place, proving that they're doing alien clearing, the price of the property is impacted. So part of our educational is getting government and the farmers together and trying to show that we can actually help them with um, conservation management plans and help see that we, through job creation, help um, alien clearing. That's a little bit from me. Wonderful. I, it's really amazing the work. We, we do have a few questions. So um, we're going to pose that to the panel afterwards. We're going to, um, I think there's all a contribution, but uh, Nora from uh, Longridge is here who's, uh, and they're organic producers. Talk a little bit about um, sustainable farming, how this fits into what Shelley and Nora um, have said going forward. So, so, so over to you, Nora Longridge. Hi, everyone. I'm standing in for Jasper Rath tonight. He is unfortunately on the road and has just messaged me that they are a few kilometers away from their guest house. He is doing a function tonight. So I apologize for him not being here. Um, I think uh, what Shelley has mentioned um, and Nora Delheim, uh, you as well, um, I think that's very, very important when we talk about sustainable farming. And we at Longridge are trying to create exactly that. And to us, the most important part of sustainable farming practices is definitely at the looking at the soil. And I think, Marta, what you mentioned, you know, the five points um, with water being one of the most important things is, is so true in South Africa. Um, and what we've been doing is we have been starting a project to create living soil. Um, and I don't know if everyone knows what living soil means, but it's basically creating a micro orgasm or, uh, or organism, organismus, um, not orgasm, please. <laughs> <laughs> that was a, a no, no. Um, so uh, 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 all these little beings to actually create almost something like a forest floor where everything is alive. Um, you've got um, microscopic bacteria, up to little critters like mice and moles that is all part of creating that beautiful soil that puts uh, nitrogens back into the ground uh, with cover crops, um, even indigenous to South Africa, that is basically left and rolled as a carpet on the soil to create um, a bed of nitrogen and nutrients for the soil and also actually helping with, um, with the global warming issue. Because at the end of the day, 
um, you are cooling down the soil and therefore moisture retention in the soil is also something um, that is better retained. And we have found physically in the middle of, of the drought, um, you know, we all have probes on the farm to check what the water content is to see where we need to irrigate. Um, and a few times uh, tests were done uh, by the company that comes in to do the probing. And um, we've actually had them retest our soil once or twice because the readings were so different to the farms around us. Just showing that farming organically and biodynamically actually, actually makes a huge difference to the moisture content in the soil. So basically, what we're trying to do is we are trying to create an environment where topsoil um, and regenerative farming um, is, is the essence of, of what we do. So no pesticides, no herbicides. And you know, it is, it's really not that difficult to do. And I think what we need to do in Stellenbosch is all get together and try and see how we can start creating an environment where pesticides and herbicides are not needed, that we can actually start working more natural and, and help ask nature um, to be part of the ecosystem again, you know, that we can all stand together and work towards uh, a future where we can actually combat climate change. You have... Uh summarized it incredibly well. Thank you, Nora Longridge. Um, I, I think that we have two questions which are very relevant to what all three uh, speakers have so um, articulately confronted. The first is uh, obviously um, something about agribusiness, because is it, is it fine just for the small guys to be doing it? So Ken asks, uh, but the big guys can do whatever they want. How could we, the wine industry, bring the large agribusiness corporation to be part of our progressive actions? So maybe I can start with uh, Nora. You're a big Which one. Which Nora? Uh, Nora Dalheim, sorry. I'm not sure I get your, your question, Jonathan, sorry. So they're saying, how can they get um, agribusinesses, not only the smaller businesses, but the obviously the large agricultural corporations, maybe in the wine industry, to sort of buy into it and be part of the collection act of action to make a change in the sphere? Or do you think they are already doing that? I think um, the consumer is expecting all of us to be, be doing it already. It's not a... Um, suddenly uh, we're going to be greenwashing ourselves. It's uh, expected of every single person in the industry and in society to be uh, mm. soci uh, um, socially sustainable as well as environmentally sustainable. So to me, it's not even a question of how do we get them to be involved? It's everybody is expected to be involved. Um, how you greenwash it afterwards is probably your own issues and you uh, don't sleep at night. But I sleep very well when I wake up at 12 o'clock at night and the camera has just taken a picture of the leopard walking past um, in the mountains. So um, that, that gives me a real kick when we see the leopard pictures in the middle of the night. So, you know, it, it depends what, what uh, makes you tick. Um, my passion for our nature and where we grew up and, and, and the farm that we live and are privileged to look after for generations to come. Um, yeah, we should be doing absolutely everything to, to look after the, the planet. I mean, uh, my son has already told me that it's all our fault, that it's all, all messed up and it's too late anyway. So um, um, I hope we can still do something to, to turn around what, what we've, um, we're leaving behind. Um, I mean, everything from bottle recycling, we used to recycle bottles 20 years ago, and then you would get your recycled bottles and they would be dirty, so you couldn't use them. So, you know, you've, we've been down some of those rabbit holes of, of trying to be more sustainable. Um, and so now I just do what I do and 
<laughs> Hope everybody else does too. Point well taken. Shelley, you'd like to jump in here? Yeah, I just wanted to add that I think um, I think it's critical to get all sectors of you know small um, farms as well as the big agri businesses involved, and I think their roles would be different as well. We're seeing you know more and more that it's great to work with partners in the value chain. It's in everybody's best interest to start really getting a tangible um, target on what they want to do around climate change and and addressing their risks, but. What does it mean for each person in that value chain is, is quite different. So if you get the retailers making these bold commitments, but they're also supporting their suppliers to manage um, what they're doing to measure more. Um, I think that's critical. And we're seeing some great examples through the work we're doing. But also in the South African wine industry, you know, we there's there's well over it's almost 95 percent that are already using the integrated production of wine seal on the neck of the bottle for export and so i think that's already a showcase that's saying whether you're a big producer or a smaller producer there's a lot um, of commitment that co collective action that's happening um, at an industry scale and then it's just to pull out you know the, these shining examples between both Noras of the farming practices that and the benefits that that you know taking it to that next step can really showcase and that's the connecting with your consumer getting them to understand what it means to to you as, as the individual landowner and farmer, but also to me as a consumer saying, I want to support you by buying this wine. And perhaps, hopefully, we'll pay a little bit more um, when we see that, that sticker on the bottle. So, awesome, mm. awesome. Uh, Nora, like, you want to say something uh, quickly? We, um, and then we've got one more question and then we've got to wrap up. I'll quickly just mention, I think, again, Marta made a very, very good point. And I think the most important thing we can take away from here tonight is education, education, education. We need our, supplier, our, our um, suppliers and our retailers, as well as producers, need to educate the market. They want us to tell them what they need to do. They want us to tell them, this is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to use because it's the best and, and we making it work. That's what we need to do. And we all need to stand together for that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nora. Um, so Jenna says, are Stellenbosch wine farmers using agroforestry on their farm with the goal to increase biodiversity, improve soil health, improve economic sustainability and fight climate change? Is this actually happening? Um, who would like to kick off? Um, yeah. 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 Uh, jumping here, we actually we we actually busy with the University of Stellenbosch um, Forestry Department to do. They've got a um, doctorate program, checking out hybrid um, pine trees um, for forestry. Uh, we are one of the few farms in the Western Cape doing um, pine forest and they're looking at uh, research in hybrid trees that do not spread. Um, so that's something we are working with the university to see if there's solutions in, in agroforestry and possibly um, yeah, mixed with the uh, conservation of the fainbos. Hmm. I think it's so hard to to pinpoint everything. There'd be many examples of this. Um, so Nora from Longridge, you guys are also doing, I mean, agroforestry is basically mixing all the different uh, crop types so that they all feed off each other. It's, it's like permaculture. And um, uh, many of the farms are doing that around their vineyards or as part of the processes. I also know Spear doing great work um, with their treepreneurs program where they've been clearing in the along the river section and then working with the local community um, who look after little tree seedlings and, and grow them to a certain level of maturity and then they get um, contribution, whether it's a, a food parcel or something in exchange for that tree and then they plant, plant them along the river. So there's many examples of how, you know, we as individuals can take our role um, quite seriously and make an impact um, 
but then we need that collective action. I agree with you. But I think um, in Stellenbosch, there's, there's shining examples. So we just need to get that message out there, like we were saying. Yeah. Can I, an, can I just add that it's not about just hmm. collective, it's collaborative as well. Yeah. And it's about behavioral change. We need that, not just in South Africa, but everywhere in the world. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the uh, interesting thing about collaboration, it's about uh, low power and high trust. It's always about relying on, on, on other people. Um, Nora, you want to say something, um, something here? Nora from uh, Longridge to wrap up on this question. I really think that um, everything has been said. Um, again, uh, you know, this needs to be um, a message that we all send out there uh, collaboratively. Let me not make the same mistake that I made early with micros. Uh, I won't repeat the word. Um, but I, I really believe that, you know, we should all stay, stand strong and uh, almost not take any nonsense from the consumer. Because at the end of the day, we produce a product. The way that we make it sound cool, the way we market it, is the way that people get excited about it. So the way that we send that message through is going to be whether they're going to accept it or not. So make it cool, you know, that's what we need to do. Thank you. And I think that uh, is where we should call it. And uh, I think it was one of the easiest web webinars that I've ever had to facilitate because it, it kind of ran itself. Um, you know, I was like, what am I actually doing here? I'll just join the conversation, I think. Uh, but I'd really like to thank uh, everybody for participating. And it was so great because everybody was so passionate about it. And this is one conversation of a continuing conversation. And so think of it as the beginning of a change in sentiment and and continual conversations uh, over this topic. Um, and so uh, while it's the end of the webinar, it's certainly not the end of these discussions. And so uh, I'd really like to thank uh, the Porter Protocol Foundation and Marta um, and Celebosh Wine Roots for, for bringing this all together and for the wonderful pa panelists who's taken their time uh, at five o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon to come and talk about a really important topic. And I think it's something that's uh, a conversation that's really gonna grow both within Stellenbosch and for the South African wine industry and ho hopefully spread globally. Um, I think for the first time, uh, we're realizing how uh, uh, certain uh, problems in certain uh, systems affect your own system and that we all need to have these conversations um, in order to to uh, prepare for the future and to really um, uh, face this uh, challenge this grand challenge together so thank you to um, all the people behind the scenes um, there's a lot of kind of back background work that gets done um, thanks to them and obviously also very much to the Stellenbosch wine route team for facilitating this and to put a protocol again. Thank you and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.